Hi, my friend, it's Doreen, and I am so excited to bring an interview with Justin Peters to you today. Many of you have seen that I've been recommending his Clouds Without Water series for a long time, and he personally has been so helpful to me in my walk with Christ by his teachings. He's a, as you'll find in this interview, he's a very clear and down to earth and warm and loving teacher. We will discuss topics that many of you have been sending me letters about, such as are spiritual gifts still for today? Are there still the gifts of prophecy? What about the gifts of healing? What if someone had a healing at a New Age event? Where did that come from? We're going to be talking about how God talks to us still today. We'll be talking about demons and people who say that they're binding demons. We'll be talking about whether someone is really casting out a spirit, such as Jezebel. We'll also talk about some of the practices that you often hear discussed, such as decreeing and declaring and speaking a word over you. A lot of those you may wonder, is that actually in the Bible or is that being taken out of context? Justin Peters is going to discuss this. He holds two seminary degrees, including a master's where he wrote his thesis on the word faith movement. And part of his interest in the word faith movement is because he has lifelong cerebral palsy and he went to some word faith healing sessions as a teenager and later had some theological insights into what was going on when he wasn't physically healed. His website is justinpeters.org. I'm going to highly recommend that you read his testimony letter there. It is profound. Please stay tuned. I think you're going to really enjoy this interview with Justin Peters. Justin, thank you so much for being with us here today. A lot of us have watched your videos, especially Clouds Without Water, and your testimony on your justinpeters.org website has meant so much to me personally, and I know that others have been moved and convicted by your testimony as well. So it's just such an honor to talk with you today. Thank you so much, Doreen. I appreciate that very much. And, uh, you know, rejoice in the work that the Lord has done in your life. It's been it's very encouraging to me to hear as well. So it's an honor to be with you. Thank you. All glory to God. It wasn't anything to do with me. Indeed. I, I'm indeed. a Romans 9 poster child here. <laughs> <laughs> All of us. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, Justin, I get a lot of letters from people who leave the new age as I was pulled out and they go to church. But, and, and this happened to me too at first, we don't have discernment unless we've really studied scripture uh, to know what churches would be true to scripture or not. When my husband and I were first, we both got out of the new age at the same time and we, we started at a Pentecostal church and then we kind of stumbled around. We went to a Seventh-day Adventist church for a while and we were at Episcopal church for a year and a half and, and it really was a lot of church shopping. Um, but I, I hear from a lot of people today who get involved with charismatic churches and they want to know about spiritual gifts. So the Bible talks about kind of different tiers of spiritual gifts, doesn't it? It does, Doreen. It certainly does. And uh, yeah, your journey is, is very similar to an awful lot of testimonies I've heard from people that were saved out of that deception. And then they kind of, as you said, stumbled around into different churches until they kind of got their theological legs under them a little bit. But uh, um, yes, there there's a lot of confusion out there about spiritual gifts. And there are different tiers, if you will. There there are what are known as the apostolic gifts, the sign gifts, which would include tongues, interpretation of tongues. And those are two separate gifts. A lot of people don't realize that but they're two separate gifts. So tongues, interpretation of tongues, gift of miracles, gift of uh, physical healing. Those are the apostolic gifts, the sign gifts. And then you have other more normative gifts, if you will, like teaching, mercy, administration, the gift of exhortation, the gift of giving, the gift of hospitality, the gift of discernment. Those are the kind of more normative gifts. Um, and there's a debate as to whether or not the apostolic gifts continue to be in operation today in the church. Uh, if you are a continuist or a continuationist, that means that you believe that all of the spiritual gifts, including the apostolic gifts, remain in operation today. Uh, that's another way of saying that is you're a charismatic. That is the charismatic position. And then there's another position known as cessationism. If you are a cessationist, that means that you believe 
not that all of the spiritual gifts have ceased, but only the apostolic gifts have ceased. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, miracles, and physical healing. And uh, I am a cessationist. I do believe that those apostolic gifts have ceased to be in operation. They are no longer operative in the church today. They have already fulfilled the function for which they were given, and they're no longer needed in the church today. Uh, the other gifts, mercy, teaching, administration, those gifts are very much still in operation in the church today. Only the apostolic gifts have ceased. Is that because the canon is closed and there's no more revelation needed? Yes, Doreen, that, that's one of the big elements of it. That's one of the big reasons. Uh, because we do have the closed canon of scripture, we have the sufficient uh, word of God. Uh, if people are fair, if they're intellectually honest, they would have to admit that if the apostolic gifts are still operative today, then the canon of scripture cannot be closed because the apostolic gifts are revelatory gifts, meaning they reveal new information. Uh, and so if God is still revealing new information that up until this point has not been revealed, then whatever he is revealing uh, should be authoritative. It should be carried just as much authoritative weight as John 3.16. You know, or Ephesians 2, 8, 9, any verse in scripture. So if God is still giving, dispensing new information, then by definition, the Bible is not sufficient. The scriptures are not sufficient because we need all this new stuff from God. And therefore, whatever God is revealing has just as much authority as scripture itself. And so the canon of scripture, by definition, has to be open. Now, charis most charismatics would would say, oh no, the canon of scripture is closed, but, but for them to say that is logically inconsistent with their own theology. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yes, we have the co closed, completed canon of scripture. And uh, another reason, Doreen, uh, you know, the apostolic gifts, well, there are no more apostles today. That's right. There There's are no more apostles. All themselves apostles. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's right. There's a lot of people who call themselves apostles, but they don't meet the biblical criteria of what an apostle is. Mm -hmm. um, nobody anywhere on the planet meets any of the requirements, much less all of them. And so if there are no more apostles today and there aren't, then, um, then how do you have apostolic gifts? Mm. So, oh, that's a really good point. It's an umbrella then. It is. It is. Can, so can we talk about the gift of healing? Because that seems to be a real point of contention. I'm sure that you, with your background um, from your testimony, um, we learned that you have cerebral palsy. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh -huh. And that you went to Word of Faith healing sessions when you were a teenager for healing. And my background is, of course, my mom was a Christian science practitioner, as was my grandmother, my great-grandmother. And and I did see healings happen. And people who write me say, but I've seen healings. Like they'll say, Reiki, I've gotten healed. Or some shamanism, I've gotten healed. And in Christian science, which is a false theology, you know, it's part of Word of Faith from Qu Phineas Quimby, right. um, there was healing. So I always refer people to that there's false signs and wonders and um, the sorcerers in Pharaoh's court. But I wonder if you could also give me more information about how these false teachings lead to, it seems to be some genuine healings. Yes, yeah, Doreen, that's a great question. Um, so broadly speaking, there's two different kinds of quote unquote healings. You've got psychosomatic healing and organic healing. Uh, psychosomatic healing, psycho, mind, soma, body, mind over body. Uh, psychosomatic healings happen all the time. That's when someone has uh, an illness or a malady that uh, cannot be readily seen, you know, uh, pain in your lower back, uh, bursitis in your right shoulder, ringing in your ears, and, uh, you know, fibromyalgia, you know, one of these kind of things. Uh, it's not that people don't really feel something, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a malady that you can't readily see. Uh, but these, many of these kinds of conditions, not all of them, but many of them, uh, you can gain temporary relief from just by a temporary rush of adrenaline, a rush of endorphins, a rush of emotion. And when you're in a closed environment with 
hundreds, maybe thousands of people all believing the same thing, all uh, they're being subjected to this emotionally charged music. They believe that the man or the woman up on stage claims to hear from God, or, or they believe they actually do hear from God. Uh, you can you can convince yourself that you feel better, mm-hmm. and you do feel better for a little while until the euphoria subsides, a new day dawns, and the symptoms almost always reappear. This is the it's the theological equivalent of a sugar pill. Okay, so it's a placebo effect. It's the placebo effect, right. And it's very, very well documented in medical literature. I mean, it's a real thing. Absolutely. And people aren't faking it. They actually do feel better. Um, But it's not a real healing. Mm -hmm. Now, an organic healing would be a real healing, a healing that cannot be explained away just by a temporary rush of adrenaline, an amputee growing a new limb. Um, you mentioned, uh, rightly that I have cerebral palsy. I was born with CP. I walk on crutches and, uh, no matter how excited I get, no matter how good of a mood I'm in, no matter how happy I may be, if you take my crutches away from me, down goes Frazier, you know, I'm I'm not going to walk. Uh, so those kinds of things, you know, if I were to instantly be healed of cerebral palsy, that would be an organic healing. Mm -hmm if an amputee grew a new limb, that would be an organic healing. Someone born blind all of a sudden with 20, 20 vision instantly, that would be an organic healing. Uh, Those kind of healings don't happen at faith healing meetings. Mm -hmm. Uh, Benny Hinn doesn't have organic healings. He has an endless parade of psychosomatic healing. Um, Now I will say that, uh, and this is going to get a little bit nuanced, but I, I believe this to be true, not only from scripture, which is enough, of course, but, uh, but also from observation. Uh, we know from scripture that demons can, on occasion, inflict sickness. Uh, we I was going to ask you about the spiritual warfare aspect. Yes, um, demons can inflict mm-hmm. sickness. They have some ability to do that. Now, they only have all the demons and Satan himself are on a, a short leash. You know, right. It's holding the other end of that leash. But, uh, but we do see that they can inflict sickness. Now, what better way to divert somebody's attention away from the gospel, away from the cross, away from repentance and get their attention on superficial things that don't really matter than for a demon say to inflict some kind of pain in someone's body and then the demon withdraw from that person. Hmm. And the appearance is, oh, I've been healed. When in fact, that's not really what happened. You know, that the is demon, so interesting. See, I yeah. knew demons were involved with this false healings, but I couldn't yes. figure out how. I thought maybe the demons could heal to hook people yeah, no. into false systems. But it's really that they probably got the person sick, led them to one of exactly. these false teachers, and then left. Oh, that is so interesting. Exactly. Yeah, it, yeah, that's that's what that's what does happen sometimes. Uh, wow. The de- demons can't heal people, but okay. they can inflict pain. They can inflict various maladies, and so by the simple withdrawal from a person, the appearance is, oh well, I've been healed, when in fact that's not at all what happened. But I think there's just enough of that mm-hmm. in this movement, just enough of it to kind of keep people's attention focused on the superficial aspects of life. Absolutely. Health, wealth, you know, all these things. And I think a demon would be entirely happy to give the appearance of healing. If, as long as it diverts people's attention away from Mm -hmm. the things that really matter, the fundamentals of the gospel, the cross, repentance, uh, growth in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, sanctification, preaching the gospel, the real gospel. Um, they're all too happy. Satan and his demons are all too happy for people to be religious. Mm-hmm. They're all too happy even for people to call themselves Christian as long as their focus isn't on the actual gospel. If right. it's on health and wealth and all these other things, Satan's perfectly fine with that. I believe it. I mean, I went to Sunday school and church every Sunday as a child and a young adult. We had a Bible, KJV. We read the Bible, and I was unsaved. 
And I didn't even know what salvation was. So, and we had the the healing. So I completely Mm -hmm. understand what you're saying. I appreciate that you explaining that so clearly. Yeah. And, and you're right. you you rightly pointed out that other pagan religions claim to have these healings. Hindus claim to have it. New agers claim to have it. Um, so yeah, and, and that that keeps people's focus on the here and now, the temporal things of life that, in the grand scheme of things, really don't don't matter. Thank you. Well, your clouds without water videos, I've been suggesting and sending links to people for as long as I've been aware of them. And I'm so excited that you and our friend Lindsay Davis are giving a clouds without water seminar right there. And someone says that you're going into the lion's den. You're going to Redding, California, Simpson university, March 20th through 21st, 2020. And if you're watching this video after those dates, or you can't go, we'll have a link to justinpeters.org website on the description of this video where you can purchase and watch clouds without water. The latest version, it's a profound, clear teaching about the different type of word of faith um, and false teachings. And I understand you did your, was it your dissertation or your thesis on word of faith? I thought that was really interesting. I did, Doreen. Uh, when I was in seminary in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, I did my master's thesis for my master of theology degree on Benny Hinn and the word of faith. Oh, movement. oh how interesting. And, uh, so we had Costi Hinn on here just a little bit ago. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and I've Trust seen you work with him. Oh, he's amazing also. Just, yeah. It's so great how many of us who've come out of deception now, we're saying to people, beware, beware, read your Bible, compare everything to scripture. And yet mm-hmm. um, some people can't hear it. I get called cessationist constantly like it's a cuss word. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I still believe God heals people. Yes, Right? Yeah, God still right. does miracles. People think right. that cessationists think that we believe God's dead or something, and that's not it at all. No, no. And I'm so glad you brought that up because it's, it's a point I would actually really like to make and give a whole hearty amen to what you just said. Yeah, I'm a card-carrying cessationist. And I do believe as a cessationist that God still not only can, but does physically heal people today, but only when it is his sovereign will to do so. Bingo. And so, but when God heals someone, he just does it uh, because it pleases him to do it. That's not the same thing as someone claiming to have the gift of healing. Those are two totally different things we're talking about. That's comparing apples and oranges. When, when God heals people to, today, he just does it because it pleases him to do it and he does it. Uh, but that's not the same thing as someone claiming to possess the gift of healing. That's a we're- totally different ballgame. Where does faith intersect with healing? Well, here's what I tell people. If, um, if you're in Christ, if you've been born again, you have passed from death to life, you have been adopted into the family of God. If you've been granted the faith to be saved, don't let anybody tell you you don't have enough faith to be healed. Mm-hmm. Because being saved is by far the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle is not when the blind see, it's not when the lame walk. God could make me run like a deer right now if he wanted to, but that would pale in comparison to what he did for me when he saved me from my sin. When he, when he, when he took out my heart of stone, put in a heart of flesh, adopted me into his family. That's the greatest miracle of all. So don't let anybody tell you that you don't have enough faith to be healed. And really, when you think about it, it's a moot point. If you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Um, old things passed away, all things made new, you belong to God and he can and will do with you whatever he wants to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's not a matter of whether or not you have enough faith to be healed. That's, it's a moot point. If you're in Christ, you know, God can and will do with you what he wants to do. I'm not against praying for God to heal people today. There's some people that I have that I'm praying for right now that God would be merciful to and uh, in the, in a physical sense, grant healing. But, uh, I, I think instead of spending all of our time, seemingly the vast majority of our time praying for God to remove sickness, or to bring healing, maybe we should spend more time praying for things like this. Lord, sanctify me through this trial. Uh, use this trial to grow me in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Christ. Use this trial to conform me more into the image of Christ. Help me to lean harder on you. Help me to carry your name in such a way 
through this suffering, uh, carry your name in such a way that brings honor and glory to Christ. You know, um, maybe we should spend a little bit more time praying for things like that rather than always praying, Lord, take this away. Amen. So. The inner healing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, you know, there's, um, uh, there's so many verses in the Bible that, uh, are conveniently ignored by these prosperity preachers, but, uh, one that comes to my mind immediately, David in Psalm 119, 71, mm. he says, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Um, the affliction yeah. in and of itself was not good because it's all part of the fallen world, but it was good for David mm -hmm. that he was afflicted so that he might learn the statutes of God in an experiential way. Uh, learn more about God and, uh, and be sanctified, conform to, to his image. It is a, a reframing of suffering, isn't it? To see it as a way to bend toward God rather than seeing it, it that, oh, you don't have enough faith or you need to sow some seed money or any of those yes. false teachings. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and too, if, if I may, just for a minute, mm -hmm. uh, as a cessationist, a, a lot of the, you're right. A lot of times you're, you're called a cessationist. I'm called a cessationist almost like it's a, it's a bad word. Mm -hmm. And one of the common uh, accusations against us as cessationists is that, oh, you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Oh, you yes, I hear that too. You don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't believe that God is active. I, to the contrary, I am absolutely confident in the power and the person of the Holy Spirit of God and his active work in our lives, in our progressive sanctification. And I, I believe, you know, so to the contrary of this deistic view of God, like God just has removed himself and he's just kind of letting us go. He got things going, but then he just kind of withdrew himself. No scripture says that God upholds all things by the word of his power. Uh, as a cessationist, I'm, I am so confident in the active sustaining work of God that I don't even like to say things like, well, God intervened here. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, God intervened in this situation. Well, to say he intervened almost implies that most of the time he's just kind of up in heaven, twiddling his anthropomorphic thumbs without a whole <laughs> lot to do. And, and every once in a while he intervenes. No, he, he upholds all things mm -hmm. by the constant exertion of the word of his power. If God ever stopped working for a nanosecond, then the entire universe would vaporize. That's right. The entire universe would vaporize. He, he is constantly working. He's, he's never resting. He's always at work. So I think that's something that really takes a lot of prayer and probably life experience to see that suffering is something God allows. Yes. And the, the doctrines of grace are difficult at first. Um, I, I know you struggled with them. I did at first. Um, and so it's something, you, if you're struggling with them, don't reject them out of hand. Study the scripture, yeah. watch, watch Justin Peters videos, watch R.C. Sproul videos, and, and you'll see it there. It's, uh, it's right there. God is sovereign over everything, and that includes some suffering, but he does it with mercy and grace. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. One other thing that um, I, I hear from people who write to me from charismatic perspective is, is this language difference. It's, it's kind of, they have this jargon, binding demons and, and decreeing and declaring. And I can't find, well, I can find decreeing in scripture, but not in the context that they are saying it. Right. right. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right, Doreen. The charismatics have a lot of lingo that has some uh, tangential connection to scripture, or maybe, you know, some phrases that they'll take out of context, but they assign kind of like the Catholic church does with, with biblical terms. They'll, they'll at some point use the right lingo, but they assign different meaning mm. to those terms and charismatics do that. They're, they're infamous for doing that. They'll, they'll take biblical terms, but they'll, they'll redefine them and assign a meaning to them that just is not there. Uh, the only one who truly decrees is God. That is one of his immutable attributes. Uh, God decrees. He decrees the beginning from the end. We don't do that. We don't speak things into existence. God does. Uh, the, these, the word of faith, charismatic folks, they, they blur that line between God, the creator and us, his created. They demote God. And then they, in turn, they deify man. Mm-hmm. 
um, you mentioned binding Satan, binding demons, <laughs> you know, for all these people going around binding Satan, somebody sure keeps letting him back out. <laughs> you know, may, maybe you ought to go find the fellow who keeps letting him out first, <laughs> bind him and, and then go bind Satan. Or go read Revelation. Right. Yeah. Go read Revelation. Yeah. Uh, Satan one day will be bound, but he's, he's not bound yet. Uh, that's, that's so interesting. And there's all these spirits too. And when I was newly saved, I thought anyone who said they were Christian, they must know more than me. So when, when I heard about the Jezebel spirit and this spirit and this spirit, yeah. and I could, I could see Jezebel. He, she's in the Bible, you know, she's in, is either first or second Kings or, and then in Revelation. And, and so they're talking about casting out the Jezebel spirit and the spirit of uh, the critical spirit and this spirit. But, but then I did a word study, Justin, and I, I looked for the names of spirits. I could find the spirit of heaviness in Isaiah 61, three KJV. Um, I could find the, the spirit of fear, you know, just a few of them. Of course, the Holy Spirit, but I couldn't find Jezebel spirit as a phrase <laughs> or any of these other names. Yeah. Help me yeah. out here, please. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Doreen. I mean, uh, you listen to the charismatics and, and everything's got a spirit. You've got the spirit of alcohol. You've got the spirit of pornography. You've got the spirit of depression. You've got the spirit of whatever, just on and on and on. And the and religious I, spirit, that's a, that's a one I, I get a called a lot, spirit. that I have a yeah. religious spirit. You probably get called that too. Oh, yeah, I've heard that one. Oh, yeah. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. Uh, but yes, uh, all of these things have spirits. And see, this is their way of absolving people from personal responsibility. Well, if you're, if you're an alcoholic, it's because you've got the demon of alcohol in your family bloodline. Your great, 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 great grandfather was a drunk and he passed the demon of alcohol all throughout your blood run, bloodline. So you've got to break this, these generational curses. And you know, if you've got this, if you're, if you're addicted to porn, you're, you've got the demon of pornography, you know, the, there's no such thing as the demon of porn. There's no such thing as a demon of alcohol. There's no such thing as a demon of anger. I mean, it's just, these are sin issues. And so saying that you've got to bind these demons or break generational curses, that is simply a way of getting around repentance. Mm -hmm. That's how you, you overcome various sins, not by binding some demon that doesn't even exist not that demons don't exist, but there's no such thing as a demon of alcohol, but, mm -hmm. or, you know, breaking generational curses. That's, that's witchcraft. Right. You know, that's pagan, as you, as you well know, that's, that's pagan theology. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it just, it absolves, absolves people of their responsibility to repent. Um, there's a really good book. If I could give a shameless plug, it's not yeah. anything that I've done, but uh, my pastor, former pastor up until we moved just a couple months ago, but, Jim Osman, O-S-M-A-N, has written a really, really good book on spiritual warfare. Mm. It's called Truth or Territory. Truth I saw or that on your website store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really good book. And it deals with all of these misguided charismatic notions of spiritual warfare, binding Satan, rebuking Satan, generational curses, spiritual mapping, all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really helpful resource. We'll put a link here in the video description. Okay, okay great. That is great. This is so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, because when God pulled me out of the new age, I had this idea that I would go into some sort of, you know, very sanctified church, which I finally found my husband. I go to a reformed church where there's no new age nonsense at all. But gosh, it was a long road to get there and figure it out. Um, so when I was, we were first kind of stumbling around with these different churches, we were shocked that exactly what we had left in the new age was there in these churches these buildings that say Christian church on the, the front. And, and, it, and we kind of felt ripped off. We felt um, like there's all these false teachings. One of them it, that really upset me because I was very involved with the psychic part of new age where I was giving psychic readings and, and teaching psychic readings. I've repented. I've apologized to everyone. And if you haven't seen my apology, I apologize. Um, and so the, the way we were giving psychic readings is basically saying whatever popped in our head and saying that it was from an angel or a spirit guide. 
And our friend Lindsay Davis, as you know, she went to Bethel Supernatural School of Ministry, and that's what they taught her <laughs> to prophesy, yeah. was by saying whatever popped in her head. And, and so there's all these, and I'm going to put air quotes around them for anyone who's listening, not watching, prophets and prophetesses at churches. And it's identical, Justin, to what I came out of at the New Age Expos. But, yes. but those, those psychics would, would call themselves psychics. These people are calling themselves Christian biblical prophets. And so I'm very concerned about prophets. And so people, then they get on my case. Don't you believe in prophecy? It's in the Bible. The end times, daughters and sons will be prophesying. And, and so I wonder if you could help me out again uh, to unpack this whole issue of prophecy for today. Yes, yes. Um, well, it, it, it kind of goes back to something we were talking about a little bit ago with there not being any more apostles today. If there are no more apostles today, and there aren't, then there cannot be any more prophets today because the, the prophets and the apostles operated under the same authority. They were held to the same standard. And Paul tells us in Ephesians that the church was built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Uh, and you, when you build a building, you lay a foundation once and you build on top of that. Uh, so there are no more prophets today in the sense of foretelling the future, in the mm -hmm. sense of people saying, you know, like an Isaiah or a Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to me. Those, those prophets are no longer in operation. Um, the, the New Testament uh, prophets, uh, they are, you know, like John and mm -hmm. uh, even, even Agabus and uh, all the, the, you know, they're, they're no longer around today because there are no more apostles, there are no more prophets. Now, people, all, all, they'll all point to Joel, Joel mm -hmm. chapter 2, and Joel's prophecy that Peter quoted in his sermon in Acts chapter 2. Uh, and say, see, you know, prophecy is still around today. Your prophets are still around today. No, because when Peter quoted Joel's prophecy, what we see in the day of Pentecost was a, only a partial fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, not a complete fulfillment, because part of Joel's prophecy also included signs in the, in the heavens, mm. you know, uh, well, signs in true. the stars. And, yeah. Yeah. And we haven't seen those. Mm -hmm. So it was only a partial fulfillment of that prophecy. The full fulfillment, if you will, uh, won't, won't be realized until, until the eschatological events. The day of the Lord. Happening. Okay. Right. Right. Oh, okay. That is, see, this is what happens is taking verses out of context. Exactly. Exactly. And it seems like it's done for a prideful reason too. And, and, and I, oh, true, yeah. true confession, Justin, I, I feel so ashamed about this when I first was saved and I'm stumbling around trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian after a lifetime of Christian science and new age. Um, I started following a woman who actually runs a, a prophecy school and gives out certificates to be a prophet. And, right. oh my goodness. I mean, I, I came this close to being sucked into that. I thought, well, you know, I was a good psychic in the new age. I could be a prophetess. And it was God's sovereign nature that pulled me out of that and showed me teachers like yourself and Chris Rosebro and Costi Hen and helped to correct me. So, yeah, uh, it's just, it's so scary that people are being deceived. And, and from my perspective, coming out of deception that long, I really see deception as like a progressive disease. It, you start out with something like you want a healing and then you get sucked into this deception and, and it gets worse. And by the time you're done, perhaps you're in witchcraft or Wicca or something, you know, really dark and sorcery and stuff. It just, it's like, it's never enough. You even hear the prophets of Bethel saying, give me more, give me more, give me more. Right. There's no satiation there. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And Paul tells us this, doesn't he? He says that error spreads like gangrene. Oh, error always begets more error. It, it's never isolated. It, error left unchecked always leads to more error. Always. It wow. spreads like gangrene. And um, it is a progressive and a progressive, um, progressive deception. And you're right. People are not satiated with it. That's so when you start <clears throat> promising people that they're going to have experiences, they're going to have dreams and visions and healings and all this stuff. Uh, you've got to keep up the charade. You've got to keep dangling the, you know, the carrot in front of people. 
so they'll keep trying to get towards it. But as I was telling, I was on an interview earlier today. It's it's like a the charismatic movement is this endless hamster wheel. Yes. Just on it, spinning your wheels, you know, running, 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 running all the time, but you're not getting anywhere. You you can never have enough faith. You can never uh, you never realize the the real healing or the prosperity. All this it's just it's an endless hamster wheel, and it's a it's endless frustration. Yeah, and it's it, endless deception. It is. That's how it was in the New Age. It's, it was always something dangled in front of us that if right. you you know if you you you'll than, get more. <laughs> yeah, rather than just being satisfied in Christ. Thank you. Right. I mean that's that's the real divide here is that is that charismatics uh they're constantly seeking after the supposed gifts not the giver they're seeking after an experience not satisfaction in christ uh for us christ is our reward mm -hmm. he, he is the end but for those folks it he's not he's he's a means to the end you know That's you give so jesus well lip service to get his all the goodies that you're being told is on, on his table. They're going after gifts, not the giver. That's right. Boom. Even my dog is agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> so what about people who say they're going to speak a word over you? That's kind of a unique phrase I didn't hear until after I was saved. I'm going to speak a word over you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sometimes referred to as a word of knowledge. And, yes. Uh, yeah. That's nothing more than, now, Scripture does speak of a word of knowledge, but it's it's a little hard to understand exactly what that is because it's it's just it's it's just named. It's not really described in Scripture, but but best we can tell, it is just a a, an, a, a divine unction to speak forth the truth of God. Uh, but charismatics have taken that and they've they've as they do, they read a meaning into it that just is not supported by Scripture, but. Mm -hmm. uh, when charismatics say, I get a word, you know, God gave me a word. I'm going to speak a word over you in a, in a prophetic sense. Uh, God gave me a word or I'm going to prophesy over you and whatever I speak over you will come into existence, physical reality. That's just the typical psychic um, new age kind okay. of practice of like cold reading. You know, it's the same yes. thing that uh, what's, what's her name? Uh, I don't know. The, the weird lady out in the the Long Island uh, medium. Yeah, yeah. Long fingernails. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's uh she does the same thing. It, mm. cold reading, psychic readings. It's it's the same thing. A well, lot of times it's just it's just complete nonsense. Yes. And it's always it's not like biblical prophecy, which biblical prophecy, as you said, it can be foretelling, but a lot of it is forth telling. It was all come forth back telling. to the covenant. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and, and now that we have the completed canon. That's what it is. It's forth telling. It's not foretelling. In fact, James says in James chapter four, he's, he kind of chides his readers, come now, you who say we will go to such and such a city and do business and make a profit. He said, you don't even know what your life has for tomorrow. That's right. Rather, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will go to such and such a city and do business and make a profit. So, um, yeah, I mean, James tells us we don't know what tomorrow holds. So uh, that you should be really doubtful when, Thank you. Prophets or prophetesses come along and say they know what the future holds. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Oh my goodness. Well, speaking of that, um, your famous t-shirt saying <laughs> and your bumper sticker, which I'm going to buy, if, yeah. do you mind saying it here for those who've not heard it? Sure. You know, it, it's something that I said really kind of off the cuff one night in one of my seminars and it, somebody wrote it down, I guess, and put it out there and it kind of took a life on its own. But yeah, what I say is, if you want to hear God speak to you, read your Bible. If you want to hear God speak to you audibly, read it out loud. And uh, that's kind of my, I guess, my only really famous quote. <laughs> it's but, uh, very famous. I actually <laughs> quoted you and didn't know it was you until recently. I apologize. Oh, that's fine. Truth is truth. There's no, yeah. There's not yeah, no, a, it's true. Right yeah. Well, can we unpack that just a little bit for people who say, but, but, but. Um, you know, because some, it's true. Sometimes I'll, I'll have a scripture just pop in my head or on my heart. And yeah. I don't know, is, and, it's, and it seems to be, it's scripture. It seems to be related to what is going on. Uh, is that the Holy Spirit speaking to me? Uh, yes and no. I, more no than yes. He's, he's not speaking to you in the sense of saying, 
Doreen, I want you to remember this verse, you know, like a quotable sense. But the role of the Holy Spirit, one of his primary roles in our lives as believers is to illumine the meaning of what we already have written in scripture. And Paul says to the Colossians, he says, let the word of Christ dwell richly within you. What is the word of Christ, the written word of God? And so as we read and study God's word, we meditate on God's word, we let the word of Christ dwell richly within us. Then the, the more that happens, the more um, when we face various decisions or, you know, something comes up on a daily basis in our lives, you know, or we uh, have some crisis or decision we've got to make, the more our thinking and our reasoning will just be naturally informed by the word of Christ that is dwelling richly within us already. And so um, that's just our, our informed minds, our minds that are saturated with the word of God, um, then our minds will go, go to that just naturally. So it's not God it's, speaking. It's not special revelation. It's not special revelation, right. It's just it's the word of Christ dwelling richly within us. It is, you know, when we get to a situation and, oh, like, well, yeah, this is what scripture says about this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the principle. This is what I've learned from scripture. And this is how it applies to this. So that's all it is. It's not, uh, it's not special revelation. That's well said. You have such a great way of unpacking complex ideas and, and thoughts and, uh, and really clearly, plainly explaining them. So well, thank you for that. Sure. The gift of teaching, right? <laughs> I, I think so. I think yeah. that's, I think that's my gift. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I, Catholic tells me. That's what I, I vote for that. Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so speaking of this, is this, this is a topic that I get a lot of questions about, and I've, I've used the link to your, your videos on this topic, so please forgive me if I'm asking you to repeat yourself, but a lot of people who <clears throat> really consider themselves scripturally sound, they are Bible-believing, and they start the day reading Jesus Calling. Please help us. <laughs> okay, great question. Yes, yeah, so... Um, Jesus Calling. This is the hottest selling devotional book on the market and has been for, I think it came out in 2011 or 2012, millions and millions of copies, you know, and now there's all these spinoffs. There's Jesus Calling, you know, Jesus Calling Teenagers, Jesus Calling Moms, Jesus Calling, you know, Three-Legged Ballerinas. I mean, there's just you know, all these, all these spinoffs. Um, it's written by Sarah Young and Sarah Young got her inspiration by reading God Calling, and you, you're probably familiar mm -hmm. with that book, God mm -hmm. Calling, yeah. Yeah. written by two anonymous female mystics, and they claim to learn how to hear the voice of God, like they tuned in to just the right frequency, and when they did, God started calling them, and they wrote down what he said. This was the inspiration for Sarah Young to write Jesus Calling. She also claimed to learn how to tune in to just the right frequency. And then Jesus started calling her and she, in, in the introduction of her book, she says with pen in hand, I began writing down whatever I believed he was saying. So that's automatic writing that comes exactly. straight from the new age and occult. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, Sarah Young, that's, that's the whole book of Jesus calling. Uh, all of those 365 devotionals are written uh, in the first person for Jesus. I, Jesus, am such and such. I will do this. I will do that. They're all written in the first person for Jesus. And this is just, I mean, it's, it is the hottest selling devotional on the market. And Beth Moore claims to do the same thing. Uh, yes, Beth she Moore, does. I've seen her hairbrush yes. video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The hairbrush video. Mm -hmm. um, God, she claims God gave her a vision of the church that includes mm -hmm. Roman Catholicism. And even in her book, When Godly People Do Ungodly Things, ironically, the subtitle is that of that book is Arming Yourself in the Age of Seduction. It's an ironic subtitle. Wow. Because she, in, in her book, in practice, almost the same verbiage even that Sarah Young employs, Beth Moore employs, she says, I don't have it in front of me, but she says, basically, I did not write these words by personal preference. She says, had I not written them, the rocks in my yard would have cried out. And she says, I deliver these words to you as I receive them bug-eyed, as I sat and received them bug-eyed. So she claims that she is this passive recipient, and God began to download information to her, and she wrote it, 
and the product is when godly people do ungodly things. Well, it's, it, it tears me up because coming out of the New Age, uh, where one of the best-selling books of the New Age was analogous to Jesus Calling. It's called A Course in Miracles, which yeah. was channeled by a woman named Helen Shookman. You're probably familiar with it. And it's called the New Age Bible, colloqu- colloquially. Uh, and it's supposedly Jesus talking and explaining the Bible. And he's in that book, it's so heretical. He says there was no crucifixion, that there's uh, no need for, the, for atonement as we understand it. There's no sin. You know, it just goes on and on. And, and people believe it in the New Age. I used to. And so you've got the same thing going on in Christianity uh, where people are getting fooled. Is it because they're not reading their Bibles and comparing things to Scripture? I think so. Mm-hmm. I think so, Doreen. Uh, I think absolutely so. People, they have just little, they have cliche theology. You know, they have these little phrases that uh, are verses that they may know out of context, Jeremiah yeah. twenty nine eleven, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, they, they know them out of context. They don't understand the real meaning. But yeah, they're not reading and studying the scriptures because if they were, if they were really studying God's word and truly indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, then, then he would illumine the meaning of the scriptures to them. They would be, they would begin to understand scripture and begin to, to uh, kind of compile their theology, have an integrated uh, doctrinal theological framework, biblical framework. And, um, and they, and yet they don't because they're not studying. They just, you know, they'll, they'll watch Joyce Meyer. They'll watch little Joel Osteen, get these little phrases here and there and think that they're, they're, that's Christianity and it's anything but. No, it's like developing a musical ear. And so you can tell when a note is off. Um, right. When you study scripture, I read it every day, study it every day. I want to. It's not something that's because yeah. I think I should. That's right. Um, but then you look at Jesus calling and what she's saying, and it's, it's glaringly contradicting yes. scripture. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So why would he con- contradict what he said already? Exactly. Exactly. It doesn't take much logic to figure that out. But do people get, what, hooked in or addicted? Or is it me-centered theology? Or why, why do people fall for these things? All of the above. And uh, I think immediately of what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, that the time will come when people will no uh, longer endure sound doctrine, but will heap to themselves teachers who tickle the ears. That's right. And that's just where we are today. Most people don't want sound doctrine. They don't want to study. They don't want to uh, be told that they have to repent, that Mm -hmm. they have to deny themselves, that they have to take up the cross, that they have to put to death the deeds of the body. Like Romans 8, 13, they they submit themselves to the Lordship of Christ. They don't want that. Mm -hmm. They want to be told that they can have their best life now. Yes. They want to be told that the gospel is all about them. Mm-hmm. And so they heap to themselves teachers who tickle their ears. And I would also say, Doreen, that, that these false teachers are in and of themselves part of God's judgment. You know, that is true. Thank you for reminding me that I was going to bring that up. That's in your testimony. Because God is sovereign, so he's sovereign over everything, including what's uncomfortable to us. So, so he's, he's al- it's almost like he's allowing Babylon in. Mm-hmm. He's allowing false teachers to come and, or, or like a King Saul, you want a King, here's your King, tall right. and handsome. Yep. And, and that's so right. the false teachers are like a King Saul. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, right. that's, that's interesting. And, and you brought up repentance. Can we talk about what the, the, the insight you had that really helped me is uh, because I get a lot of letters from people who say, stop recommending Justin Peters and Paul Washer because they're works based. You know, because <laughs> they say that yep. you have that it's only faith and you don't need repentance. And that was something you struggled with for a while, wasn't it? It was. It was, Doreen, because uh, I was uh, reared in a very Arminian, mm-hmm. in the theological sense, background, decisional regeneration. You decide to make Jesus your Savior. And um, there always seemed to me to be a massive contradiction inherent within the gospel itself. And that was this that the gospel is not of works and that I understood. I understood I could not help enough little old ladies across the street to earn my way into heaven. You know, that made sense to me. Works are filthy rags. Okay. That made sense. But then in order to be saved, I would also hear people say that teach that we've got to repent, Mm -hmm. which is doing something. Right. 
you know, and, and I thought that repentance was just willing yourself to turn away from certain sins, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just, you know, give it a good college try and make yourself, you know, will yourself to, to turn away from certain sins. Uh, and so there was this massive contradiction. How on the one hand can we say that work salvation is not of works, but then in order to be saved, we've got to repent, which is doing the work. And, uh, what I did not understand until my genuine conversion, as you said, and all detailed in my testimony, on my website, is that repentance is a work, but it's a work of God. Yes. It's not something that we do. It, repentance is in and of itself a gift from God. God grants repentance. We see that in Acts chapter 5, 30 and 31, Acts chapter 11, verse 17. And then again in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 through 26. All of these texts speak of God granting repentance. Mm -hmm. So we can't repent on our own. That, that initial repentance unto salvation is a work of God. That's a monergistic, we use that term, work. Mono, mm -hmm. one, ergos, uh, or ergon, work. Mm -hmm. So it's that one work of God. God grants repentance. He, is it that he grants us the desire to repent? Or you, you talked about this moment of being broken, which I can so relate to. When, it find, I had, when I read Deuteronomy 18.10, where Moses is talking to the Israelites, he won't be with them. He's telling them they're about to go into this pagan land. Don't be like the Canaanites. Don't, don't do fortune telling. Don't do mediumship. Don't do sorcery or interpret omens or signs. It's an abomination to the Lord. And, and that that verse broke me and I was on my knees, I think about three days, just weeping. And so that moment of that insight, that's, that's the gift from God, right? Yes. Yes, that's right. That, that is a gift of God. And, and repentance, it is granted by God. It is uh, accompanied by what Paul describes in second Corinthians chapter seven, a godly sorrow. Yes. A godly sorrow over sin. And this is something that I wish I could just shout from the rooftops and everybody would hear is that there's two different kinds of sorrow over sin. There's a worldly sorrow and a godly sorrow. Paul speaks about it in second Corinthians seven, a worldly sorrow. Paul says leads to death. A worldly sorrow is nothing more than a guilty conscience. Mm -hmm. A worldly sorrow is the kind of sorrow that is, that says this, what would happen to me if my sins were exposed? What would be the consequences to me? And so we try to cover up our sin, not because we grieve over it, but because we don't want the consequences of it. If, if my sin were exposed, what would people think? What would be the consequences to me? So we try to cover it up. But if we could get away with it, if nobody would know about it, then we would run right back to it because that's really what we want. We, we want our sin. We love our sin. We, we love the darkness. We hate the light. So a worldly sorrow leads to death, eternal death. Now, Paul also speaks of the godly sorrow. A godly sorrow is that sorrow that is vertically oriented. It's the sorrow that David had after he had been confronted by his friend, Nathan. Nathan pointed his finger at him. He said, you are the man. Right. And he was broken. And David cried out in Psalm 51, against you and you alone, O oh Lord, have I sinned. Mm -hmm. And that's a godly sorrow. When we, a godly sorrow is when we grieve over our sin because we understand that our sin grieves God. Right. And we do not want to grieve him. And, you know, I, I tell people, Doreen, in my teaching a lot, that it's, it's good and it's right to want a savior from hell. We should flee from the wrath to come. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But just as much as we should want a savior from hell, we should want a savior from our sin. Yeah. There's a lot of people who want a savior from hell. They want to get out of hell free card. Right. But they don't really want a savior from sin. Mm -hmm. The person who wants a savior from hell, but not a savior from sin, has a savior from neither. So the difference between a lost person and a saved person or a false convert, let's say that a false convert and a true Christian is a false convert has that worldly sorrow. Mm -hmm. If he could get away with sinning, he'd still do it. A genuine Christian can, as genuine Christians, we can and do stumble into sin, but we don't swim in it. 
Right. We don't enjoy sin. We don't look for opportunities to sin. We don't mm -hmm. relish our sin. We don't treasure our sin. When a genuine Christian sins, it grieves him. Mm -hmm. It grieves Absolutely. her. So because we understand that our sin is against God and, and we don't want to grieve him. He's been so good, so kind to us, so merciful to us. And when we sin, we're just, you know, we're thumbing our, our, you know, whatever the phrase is, you know, mm -hmm. we're just, you know, uh, insulting God after right. all he's, he's done for us. And, and, and so it should grieve us. So we stumble into sin, but we don't swim in it. Mm -hmm. We don't enjoy sin. That's truly one of the differences between a, a lost person, a false convert and a genuine Christian. So, uh, yeah, for those who would say people like me and Paul Washer and MacArthur or whatever, uh, teach a work salvation. No, not, not a human works salvation, a, a godly work. It, it, salvation is a work, but it's a work of God. That's beautiful. Now, once we are converted, we have a duty to put to death the deeds of the body, Romans mm -hmm. chapter eight, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in our sanctification, we do have a part to play in that. Sanctification is a synergistic work. We work with along with the Holy Spirit as he enables us, mm -hmm. you know, the disciplines of being a Christian, studying scripture, obeying Christ, putting to death the deeds of the body. Uh, so it's an ongoing kind of repentance that we can do as part of our sanctification. But that, uh, that initial repentance unto salvation, that's all of God. Right. All of God. It's so beautifully put. I love your, also your analogy that you could have an alcoholic man who's a chronic liar and put him on a desert aisle where there's no one to lie to, no other person and no alcohol. So he seems to be without sin. Right. <laughs> but the moment there's another person or alcohol, he's going to go right back. It's not That's genuine right. repentance. That's right. Yeah. And, and repentance bears fruit. There's fruit in mm -hmm. keeping with repentance. See, repentance is, uh, we hear all the time, is the Greek word metanoia, which means a change of mind. And that's true. Uh, that is what metanoia means, a change of mind. But the final, the full meaning of a word is not always determined by the dictionary or the lexicon. The full meaning of the word is determined by the Holy Spirit because he is the one who uses the words. He's the one who puts those words into their context. And he is the one who determines the full meaning of a word, not the lexicon. Mm -hmm. And we know from scripture, from the context of, of metanoia, that it bears fruit, right? That's what Paul said to King Agrippa in Acts 26. Mm -hmm. It's what John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter three. Real repentance bears fruit. It's a right. change in our mind, but our, everything about us has changed. Our minds mm -hmm. are changed but our hearts are changed. Our affections are changed. Our desires are changed. And when our affections and desires are changed, there will be inevitable fruit in keeping with that repentance. Amen. So, so well said. Thank you. Um, do you have time for one more question? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, the Bible's filled with people receiving dreams from God and mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you could talk about if dreams from God are still for today. Yes. Great question. And in short, no, they're not. Um, Hebrews one, one and two, I think puts yes. the brakes on this. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, God long ago spoke to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. Mm -hmm. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, in the old days, God spoke in a lot of different ways. He spoke in dreams. He spoke in visions. He spoke in burning bushes. He, he, he spoke on one occasion in a talking donkey. All right. So he did speak in many different portions and in many different ways. But in these last days, says the writer of Hebrews, he has spoken to us in his son. Jesus is the final speaking of God. Everything that God has to say, he has said in his son, Jesus Christ, and we have a perfect, inerrant, infallible, all sufficient record of that in his word. So Jesus is the final speaking of God. It's, and people say, oh, well, well, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God spoke in dreams and visions back then and he never changes, then how can you say he's not doing that now? Well, it, that's, that's a misunderstanding. It's a basic, fundamental misunderstanding of 
what we call the immutability of God, that, that God does not change. Christ does not change. It's not that God has changed. It's not that his character and his nature has changed. It's simply that his revelation has progressed through the centuries, culminating in the person and work of Christ. Mm -hmm. So his character and his nature unchanged from eternity past. His revelation, though, has progressed. Um, one of the mistakes that people make, well, if God did something in the days of the Bible, that means he must be doing it today. Well, no. I mean, God, God, parted the Red Sea, but I don't see God parting seas today. <laughs> True. You know, God God made a donkey talk in yes. Numbers 22, but I haven't seen any talking donkeys lately. <laughs> and if you have, if you are seeing talking donkeys, <laughs> you probably need to spend some time in Ephesians chapter five and run off the suds. So, uh, you know, so it's a, it's just a, it's a, it's a basic fundamental flaw that, uh, a logical flaw that people make. I love it. Thank you. You are such a clear speaker. And again, if you're watching this before March 2020, do consider going to Redding, California, the, the hive's nest, the mothership of Bethel. Yeah, right. You've, you've heard Justin talking about Bethel. You've seen a lot of videos that I've done about Bethel. And so it's March 20th through 21st, 2020, Simpson University, Redding with our good friend, Lindsay Davis. So that's going to be, and it's free, right? Yes, yes, as far as I know, it's free. Yeah, yeah. First come, the first the serve. The more the merrier that's going to be. And we pray that some Bethel students go and hear the truth. I really want that. And, and, and if I may, if there happens to be any Bethel students that are watching this, uh, know that I would love for you to come. I really would. I would love for you to come. Come and, and just listen and, and hear me out. Open your mind to the truth of what God's word really has to say. Uh, I, don't, I don't hate you if you're a Bethel student, not at all. I would love, love, love to see you come out of, of this deception and come into a right understanding of who Christ really is. So Amen. please do come. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And can I trouble you or ask you to please pray out our video today? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Father, we're grateful for uh, this time that you've given to us and uh, how we how we rest in the sufficiency, not only the inerrancy, but the sufficiency of your word. Uh, I thank you for Doreen. I thank you for the marvelous work that you've done in her life and bringing her out of what was a pagan deception. And, and even in her early years of um, kind of meandering around in the charismatic movement, uh, not that that in and of itself was good, but in your good providence, you, you helped her to understand that, that, the, the pagan notions are, are alive and well in so much of what is being called Christianity, but it's not Christianity. So uh, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would continue to call your sheep out of the deception, pull them away from the wolves. Lord, help us to be satisfied, not in the things that false teachers tell us are being offered uh, on the master's table, but help us to be satisfied in the master himself. Help us to be conformed in the image of Christ and part of that confirmation conformation comes in our in our suffering in our trials and through that suffering and trials Lord help us to carry your name well uh, I pray for Doreen I pray for her continued ministry to all these ladies that she is reaching and uh, uh, pray that you would bear good fruit in that all for the glory of Christ it's in his name we pray amen Thank you so much. It's been such an honor to be with you. I can't tell you how much this means to me personally and to everyone who's going to watch this. Your work is golden. Oh, thank and you. We're, Lord. we're praying for you. Good work too. Thank you. All right. Appreciate your time. God bless You're you. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank you. you too.